you may have heard of uh, the confinement of veal calves. Uh, perhaps one thing that Americans have been more informed about is um, that veal is uh, often cruelly produced. And so there has been a bit of a boycott of veal production. Uh, and this system is now on the way out. Um, these are individual stalls for veal calves. The stalls are actually fairly similar to the sow stalls that you saw. Um, but uh, the calves are kept there uh, um, from the time they're taken from their mother until they're ready for slaughter, which is about 14 weeks. The, um, the point of this method of production uh, was to enable it to be possible to produce pale, soft veal. Veal should be a pale pink color rather than a red color, um, and it should be much softer than beef. Um, to produce pale pink veal from a much larger animal than you would get if you did it in the traditional way. The traditional form of veal was a calf that had only sucked milk from its mother. Um, and if you left the calf with the mother, then there's two problems with that. Firstly, the calf will drink the milk that otherwise you can sell because these are the calves of the dairy industry. And secondly, um, the calf will start eating grass quite soon. And once it starts eating grass, its flesh becomes more normal red color and you can't get the same price for it that you could get for the pale soft veal, a price that's usually paid by, by uh, expensive restaurants. So it was discovered that if you take the calf away from the mother, then you have these two advantages. Firstly, you, the mother, you can take the mother's milk and sell it. Secondly, you can feed the calves purely on a kind of milk replacer, which is um, effectively more of the skim milk, um, so the, the more valuable cream is taken off it. Um, and by keeping any straw away from the calves, then the flesh stays pale because the, the calf is in fact anemic. Um, there's not much iron in milk, and uh, although that's okay for the first few days of the calf's life, if, um, if the calf doesn't get iron, the calf becomes anemic, and that's why the calf's flesh is pale rather than a healthy kind of red color. And uh, you know, that's why if you, if you read when I did research on this for animal liberation many years ago, you could actually read the instructions that the veal producers uh, gave to their individual farmers, the sort of big producers who franchised it out to individual farmers. They said, make sure that there aren't any rusty iron um, things within reach of the calves. Rusty iron hinges on the crates, for example, because the calves will lick them and um, if they lick them, they absorb iron uh, from the uh, metal fit iron fittings and their flesh will go darker and you won't get the top price for it. So um, it's clear that the cars were anemic because they wouldn't be licking iron if they didn't somehow have a need for it. Now, as I say, this is really on the way out. Um, even the American veal producers themselves have now ad admitted that this is not a humane way to keep calves, and they are recommending that producers phase it out. So I think there are still units using this method, but uh, we hope that in 10 years there won't be. Uh, and I should say the sow stalls that I showed you are also, there's also some move to get rid of them. Um, and that's come as a result of consumer um, pressure and, and consumer awareness and the animal movement, which has um, pressured some of the big users of pork to avoid um, pork from uh, sows that were confined this way. So um, uh, even McDonald's, for example, have said that they're phasing it out and they've told their producers that they have to get rid of the individual stalls. Um, I can't remember exactly the date, but sometime within the next uh, 10 years. <coughs> OK, um, this is beef production, um, a, a beef feedlot. Um, it's less intensive, clearly, than what you've seen before. Uh, the cattle have certainly have room to move around. Um, it's a vast uh, area uh, that the modern feedlots in the Midwest and West uh, take up. Um, and they're being fed on, on grain, which has its own problems that I'll come to. Um, perhaps from a welfare point of view, the grain is a problem. It's more difficult for them to digest in a way than uh, grass, but they do seem to eat it quite readily. There's also um, problems with the lack of shelter. You can see here that there's no protection from the sun. 
Um, in summer, there's also no protection from adverse weather in winter. Uh, again, it's just not worth the cost to provide that protection for the producers. But if there were shade, um, you probably, you know, if you see cattle on a hot day in a, in a field that has a tree, they gather under the tree. So if there's shade, they prefer to be in it. But um, there has to be an economic return, and it seems the economic return is not sufficient to provide shade. Okay, so since uh, we're coming up to Thanksgiving, um, I can't um, leave out the turkey production. Uh, turkey production is very similar to the chicken production that you saw. Um, it's, again, you don't see it here, but this will be a huge shed which will have many thousands of turkeys in it. Um, the turkeys are also uh, extremely crowded in these conditions. Um, and uh, will also be, be um, constantly running into strangers that they don't recognize, which is probably causing some stress. But there's another interesting fact about the uh, modern turkey, which um, if you and your family are not aware of, I suggest you might use as a topic for um, next Thursday's <laughs> dinner discussion, and that is that the modern turkey cannot breed. The modern turkey has been bred to have this huge breast, as you might know. Um, that's what um, Americans want to eat, to carve up the, uh, the breast for Thanksgiving. So the turkey uh, has been bred with such a large breast that the male is physically incapable of inserting his semen into the female. So how is it that we have so many turkeys? Well, the answer, I guess, is obvious, and here it is. They're all produced by artificial insemination. So there are people who work full-time shifts. Uh, this, is, this is here the, the female you're seeing being inseminated, but uh, there's obviously two sides to this operation. There's a group of people whose job it is all day to essentially masturbate male turkeys and collect their semen. Um, and then the semen is taken over to this group who are inseminating the female turkeys. Um, I wrote a book called The Ethics of What We Eat with um, a friend of mine called Jim Mason, who is more of a former farm boy than I am. He grew up on a uh, dairy farm in Missouri. and. Uh, found it rather hard work and decided that he didn't want to do that all his life, so he got a law degree, which was a good move. Um, but, um, but in order to find out exactly what, what goes on, um, he decided to apply for a job as a turkey inseminator. Um, it's not hard to get work as a turkey inseminator <laughs> because there's a fairly high turnover. Um, so he, he, he uh, found himself uh, working um, as a turkey inseminator. He lasted one day. Um, that provided him, I guess, with the information he needed. But um, apart from that, he said it was the hardest, uh, dirtiest, most unpleasant day's work he had done in his life. Um, and that included days he'd worked on, on the farm uh, as a boy in Missouri. Because you're under time pressure. Um, the whole point of this is to get these birds inseminated as fast as possible. So these teams. Um, do 600 birds uh, an hour, um, so 10 a minute. Um, there's uh, um, two people working. So you, you have to grab the, the female turkeys, which obviously are quite heavy birds. They weigh 20 to 30 pounds. Um, and they don't want to be grabbed, because this is something that happens to them regularly. They know that it's unpleasant, so they try to resist. You have to pick them up. You have to, um, the, the term is break them, but that means hold them over in a certain way so that the vent is open, and then you squirt the semen into them, and then you can let them go. But you're just doing this, um, um, you know, six, uh, 600 birds an hour, you're doing this all, to, all the time. And obviously the people who do it um, are not enjoying their work, they're not, um, uh, they're, taking it out. If, if something goes wrong, they're going to take it out on the birds. And some of those undercover videos that you might see, um, if you see animal abuse going on, I suggest, uh, because the people who are doing the work are themselves under stress and under pressure, and there's a tendency, if things are not going well in your life, to take it out on somebody inferior to you, on someone lower than you, 
and uh, obviously if you're working with animals, they're the ones that you take it out on. So, um, so that's a, uh, a further problem with uh, turkey production. Now, um, as I said, Rachel's argument seems to me pretty clear against what I've just been talking about. That is pretty clear against using the products of those forms of farming. <coughs> that argument seems to me one that is very difficult to deny, and it does mean we ought to avoid factory farm products. Whether it's an argument for vegetarianism, as Rachel suggests, might depend on, firstly, whether you can get truly humanely treated animal products, and secondly, whether you accept an argument like this, that um, uh, it's in some way OK because the animals wouldn't have existed without us creating them, and if they have good lives, as uh, Roger Scruton says here, if um, their all duties of care are fulfilled and the demands of sympathy and piety um, are respected, I don't know about piety, whether that's appropriate, but Scruton is a conservative philosopher who thinks that piety is appropriate to God's creation, uh, perhaps, and um, uh, thinks that you can combine that with uh, using, using animals. Obviously, we had some discussion about the uh, ethics of killing. You would have to think that it's not wrong to kill them. And then maybe you could say that Rachel's argument does not require vegetarianism if you can get these alternatives. So they do exist. Um, so here's an alternative to that turkey production. Free-range turkeys are a different breed of turkeys from the ones that I showed you before. So these turkeys actually can mate naturally. You don't have to um, artificially inseminate them. You're clearly going to play quite a lot more for these turkeys, but um, it's at least possible, I would say, to, to mount an ethical defense of a Thanksgiving based on a turkey of this kind in a way that I don't believe it is uh, a turkey of, of the kind you saw before. <coughs>